welcome to the interesting podcast episode number 144. This episode is with the overly talented Taylor Gray. He is an actor, a writer, and he's just a great dude. You probably know him best as the voice of Ezra Bridger from Star Wars Rebels, or as one of the writers of the fantastic play Sold in the Name of Sex. He's also such a fun hang. We talk about where his interest in acting started, having super supportive parents, being inspired by John Linguizamo while working on the take, how he got the role of Brian on Thunderstruck with Kevin Durant, what the rehearsal and taping process was like on Bucket and Skinner's Epic Adventures for Nickelodeon, we talked about his audition for Ezra, his favorite episodes of Rebels, what it was like to actually perform his original play in Edinburgh, and so much more. Taylor is fantastic, and you're going to love him, so let's just jump right into this. Please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 144, with Taylor Gray. Theme song time. That's right. What a wild time to be alive. Isn't that oh, crazy? Yeah. I, crazy. I, the, the way that I look at it is like, it'll be great to say we live through it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's like right now it's terrible, but like in five years when we're like, remember the pandemic? And you're like, oh yeah. That oh was yeah. Cool. I mean, we could talk to anyone anywhere in the world and you could say like 2020 and they're like, yeah. 2020. <laughs> they just, you just get that shutter, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's one person in the back that like covers your mouth. Not here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome though. That's awesome. Is it is it cold there? I don't know the it UK. Yeah. It is cold. And I um I definitely am more an LA person. And so like <laughs> I've been wrapped up. This is the least I've worn sure. in a while. I usually have a scarf on, a beanie. It, it's <laughs> it's uh freezing here. I I'm I'm with you there. I uh I live in Florida. And uh, my blood has thinned out to an embarrassing level where okay. if it's if it's in the 60s, I'm like, what is happening right now? Sure. It's the I, I'm in the same boat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm having to talk in centigrade out here where it's like yeah. it's zero right now, which is freezing. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, we had snow a couple of days ago. Sheesh. Good yeah. Lord. Are you from are you from California? Yeah. Right on. Right on. Yeah. What was that like? It was nice. It was nice because I, that was how I kind of got into acting was just proximity. I was there. Oh. I grew up in Orange County. So very close to. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I always wonder about that with people that grew up in like the surrounding areas. If it's how you choose to go into something that's proximity. Cause a lot of times people rebel against it and they're like, because it's here, mm. I'm not going to do it. You know? Yeah, yeah. Was that, was that something that you did like pretty early on? Well, it was funny because like where I, I grew up in Orange County, which is like an hour south. And mm -hmm. so no one in my area or town or like even in our district of high schools was in acting. So I remember when oh. I was getting into it, we like I asked my mom, like, is there anyone I could talk to about this? And it like there was no one really in the area. And so once I was working and I like was on a Nickelodeon show, then like around town, that became kind of like a thing. Um, that there was like an actor because it was mainly a sports town everyone oh, um, where I grew up okay. was into like the people that had gone off and like left uh, were mainly athletes gotcha you know what see I see that thread because I may or may not know about your uh, your basketball prowess maybe I know maybe I don't definitely play some basketball you definitely know? play you know? basketball yeah interesting you went the acting route okay okay mm -hmm. that's pretty cool did, yeah. Did you did you want to play basketball? I would have loved to, but I am not six five, and so yeah. when I realized that was the case, yeah. um, <laughs> I'm a, a realist, and I knew. But also, like that's a funny question. Like I've never asked myself, maybe because it is obvious to me, if I had the choice between being a professional basketball player, or professional actor, I would definitely choose actor. Yeah. 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 Was there like a moment? when you were like oh like the acting bug hit or was it just sort of something that organically sort of grew um i from a young age i i had 
I, I didn't know because I knew my parents didn't want me to do it yeah. necessarily. <laughs> like when That's I fair. first expressed interest in it, they're like, I think they just heard the stories about it. My mom's a psychologist and it like, oh. there's often like with <laughs> kids who are actors that it can be a handful and sure. you just heard the classic stories. But my parents are so cool as well in that they are enablers and whatever my brother, sister, and I wanted to try, they were willing to allow us to do. And I didn't ever know how much I was interested in it until I saw home videos not long ago uh, where I was oh. like 10 years old and I had my brother with the camera and I'd be like, all right, shoot me here. But it was he was recording because he didn't know <laughs> anything. He's like, he was eight at the time. Sure. So like it would just be recording while we're figuring everything out. And I was like, oh, wow, I, I really wanted to do this. Like sure. I would do a million takes until it was perfect and I would watch it. <laughs> and it, it, it's really sweet looking at then. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until I think I was about like 13, 14 that I began to take it seriously. Really? That's that's yeah. pretty cool, though. A lot of people yeah. like you don't realize, especially acting. It's like you don't realize that till later on in life. You're like, I'm really going to do this. So at a young age, yeah. you get that sort of like first lap in early. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was nice because you did. You got to you got to uh, work with training wheels. And one of the biggest thing in acting is is what you do outside of the work. Like your life so totally. much informs your 100%. work. And at the time, like it, it is tough for artists, and this is across the board. I think um, when there's desperation, when, when they need to work or something, when you're young, yeah. like I was equally interested in the basketball game Friday night that I was playing in and sure. like the dance I was going to go to with my date and like hanging out with my friends as I was in jobs. And when I went on auditions, like I would get so obsessed with it, but at the same time I could forget about it the next day and, and carry on with school. You know what I mean? Right. And so that was really nice because as I got into it, also having a sports background, like once I got my first job, I remember my dad and I having a conversation where it was like, if I'm going to do this, I, I want to be really good at it. Like there's no sure. use in doing something if you're not going to really go for it. And I got into like five different acting schools and it was each night of the week. And so Dude. my parents were amazing in that they drove me up to LA every night um, wow. for years. And so it was nice to study when I was younger because you begin to see the world through those eyes where it was like, in school, the amount of the amount of characters I've I've picked off from like classmates or, or different people was sure. um was kind of unbelievable because that's just how you were looking at everything. I was from about age eleven or twelve. I was like, I'm looking at the world as an actor. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, what are our emotions? What what makes people tick? What what do people do when they're in this situation? You know what I mean? And so in that sense, um, subliminally, I think it really helped a lot. Yeah, I bet. I, I love that. It, it's like you almost have to be introspective as well as look at everything else. And like, I, I love it. I love it too. Just like watching yeah. people and you're like, okay, so you have this emotion. How are you choosing to convey that? Now, oh, I wouldn't have done it that way, but you're doing that because of this. It's like, yeah. it's, it's so the human condition can be very interesting to look at from the outside. Oh, a hundred percent. And if you start early on, I mean, dude, killing it, killing it. it. It helped out. And and again, I mean, I'm so fortunate to have parents that were willing to do it. And then you yeah. obviously need the like stroke of luck that comes in because always, the, I mean, the amount of auditions you go on and, and the amount of people that are vying for these roles things just came together in a way that was uh kismet and and serendipitous and then from there what you did with it i think right. was what mattered and then it was just like pedal to the metal I, I remember i have a i have a t-chart my mom has it somewhere of like i was debating whether going to university or mm -hmm. continuing with acting and i just recently finished my bachelor's um, oh, congrats. Like I, it took me extra long because I did it online and I obviously sure. chose to go acting and not stop yeah. and, and go You're to school, busy. <laughs> but it was, it was a big thing because at the time it was like, I could put this on pause, but like I had come off a show th and things were rolling. And I remember my dad telling me, he was like, this is what you love to do. And he was like, look, you're going to fail at any job you do. So like, don't take like what you think is a safer route, meaning like you'll, you'll eventually succeed, but there will be failures. Sure. He's like, if he's like, I've seen you have your failures in that like you audition for stuff you really want and you get really close you don't get it and it breaks you for a second but he's like you get back up next day and you love it so much that you keep going he's like if it's mm. if it's you doing your safe thing and you're getting told no at that you're going to start having a response of like I, this isn't even what i want to do first <laughs> you know what i mean and you're telling me no like 
Yeah. It's, it's, I just think like, and, and I'm again, so grateful my parents, like follow your passions wholeheartedly. And, and that's what um, I've done. And thus far has been a really sweet thing. Yeah, man. What great parents. Well yeah. done. Well done. Yeah. But then there's that other thing, like you said, there, there's luck involved, but I find talking to a lot of people that like luck really is preparation meets opportunity. So like it is, it you, is putting in all that work and going to those classes and doing the training and taking it seriously. When those opportunities showed up, you got lucky, you know, sure. it's pretty cool. It's a testament to the, the overnight success being 10 years in the making kind of stuff. That's right. It's, it takes 10 years to make an overnight success. That's always the fun one. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> nobody likes that one. When you think about what that actually means. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It is so funny though. You hear certain, cause like, I'm sure you do the same. I think so many people do when we find someone we like, we then look them up or in oh, yeah. any field really. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like, like even, even these vaccines recently for Corona, cause that's yeah, like, totally. I look some of these guys up and I'm like, Oh, came out of nowhere, created the biggest vaccine ever. No, no, no. They, they've yeah. been studying this for <laughs> years. It, like, you know what I mean? And it is right. just that time. And the same with so many actors, like a great performance is like, 10 years of performances and study to get there where you think 100%. oh this is the first time I'm seeing them on this large scale but really they've been in this and that and then they work with this person and learn from this person and it is it is such a beautiful thing and just like patience uh yeah and, and perseverance absolutely and I, I love that you crack the code pretty early on because there is that thing like everyone talks about when you go into auditions don't need it because yeah. there's that sort of neat, like if you walk in, you're like, I'm just doing this thing and whatever. There's like a psychological battle that happens with casting when they're like, he doesn't need me for something. Do I, do I need him for something? Why did, why yeah, did, yeah. Do I, does he have something we, we don't have? It's like, yeah. there's that psychology going in, you know? It's okay. true. I, I, I believe desperation is one of the worst smells. You know what I mean, and, and totally. that goes for everything in totally. relationships, everything as you, and not in an unhealthy way, but just like you, you have to, it's, it's that whole thing of like doing the inner work. You have to get there yourself mm -hmm. where something on the outside, whether it be a job, won't make or break you. You would obviously yeah. love it. And, and you're, you're doing everything to prepare for it and to make it happen. But it shouldn't be the end all be all because there will be another chance. There will be another thing. Like that's the beauty of life. And something mm -hmm. that I always talk about with my brother is like, say, say the yes is the 10th rung of the ladder. Mm -hmm. You can't then avoid starting to climb up the ladder. You have to climb through nine rungs of no. And so like when, I, even when I'm writing, I believe like this might not make the cut, but I have to write right now so that the next time I get down, maybe that one will be, because I can't just avoid uh, and go, Oh, I'm not, you know what I mean? And so I just sure. think like there is a beauty in, and that, that's one of the most amazing things that I took from acting starting young was I had been told no, a hundred times you know what <laughs> right. i mean so like that didn't uh deter me and when i've like talked to people at whether it be conventions or on podcasts or with even friends and they're like oh well what, what is like one real thing that you would live by and i think like not taking no as a final answer is a big one in that like yeah. no is just a temporary thing that in this moment no but maybe tomorrow you know what i mean and you sure. can't let that deter you was that something that like you took on early or you had to learn that like finish not perfect is something I struggle with for sure. Like, yeah. do you, do you hit that as well? I know what you're talking about. Cause the perfection thing yeah. is, is huge and in acting it gets tough, but there's a beauty in it. I worry about, I've only done a couple shorts where I've been directing it and mm. that I'm a little bit more like, cause you really can make sure you sure. get it exactly right. But in acting there, there's such a beautiful collaborative thing. And Th that again, I'm so glad I played so many team sports growing up because you learn yeah. how to work with others. And like, at the end of the day, a win comes by everyone, whether or not they scored 50 points or Good you point. did, or someone else did, like you, you kind of have to come together. And on a set, you just trust that like your director as your back, the other actors and everyone's hanging out and you come with the best that you can. And sure. And then you see in the end what happens and there is some beauty to it, which is difficult at times there yeah. I, I definitely <laughs> i definitely and anyone i've worked with knows there'll be takes where we'll finish and they're like great moving on i'm like oh can we get another one you yeah know what i mean just because <laughs> you know there's something more that you can do right right that's funny do you, do you remember your first gig my first gig um i it, it would have been something with com a commercial i think and I don't okay. know, I did a handful of commercials when I started acting. Um, sure. But the first one where like 
there's a moment where I knew, oh, I want to be an actor. Yeah. And I, I think I was like 13 or so. It was the first film that I had done, and it was called The Take. Uh, oh, with Brad John Leguizamo. Was directing with John Leguizamo and yeah. Rosie Perez. Um, yeah. I played their son. Oh, and... oh that was you. <laughs> That's yeah, funny. yeah, yeah, That's, that's yeah. funny. And it was, wow. I haven't thought it, about it that. Was a, it was a heavy role in that, like, I think, I don't know, maybe I had 10 scenes or something or a handful of scenes. Sure. Um, and more than not, it was like emotional he, because the dad gets shot and it's this yep. very tumultuous journey for the family. And there are a lot of really emotional scenes. And I remember finding it a bit taxing, but that was one thing that I kind of had in my wheelhouse a bit was I always was like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to deal with comedy. But going to the emotion <laughs> was something that I I ha- kind of had a touch with when I was younger. And uh, John Luzamo is actually a, uh, and I'm throwing up air quotes, method actor in that sure. he would come to set each day and he would like have me zip up his sweater. Like he, if you had a, a zip up hoodie, really? he would like, he'd be like, Hey, uh, Taylor, can you zip this up? Or maybe you can call me Javi. I think that was sure. the name of my character. And then he would like come in and like kiss me on the cheek each day and like have me open doors for him. And I remember telling my mom, cause I was young where she would come on set with me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, why is this guy keep making me open doors for him? Like, if he tells me again, like, I, I get it. He's a really awesome actor, but like, I'm not going to open every door for this guy. And then my mom being who she is, she was reading up on it because no one in our family has any uh, connection to acting. So sure. she was like, I think he's, I think he's doing something called method acting. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and she's like, no, he's, he's embracing this role and this world through everything, even when you're not filming. And I was like, you're telling me this, maybe he was like 40 or so at the time this this mm-hmm. grown man his job is to believe that he got shot and he's actually going to believe that for the next month and a half and i was like that is the most amazing thing in the world and i yeah. i remember i remember sitting there thinking like watching him and rosie as we were all just in our cast seats thinking like wow they are really like they're sold to this different personality and they're playing dress up and like they're wearing different clothes and we're all believing in this story that just came out of this writer's head and i I, even now talking about like kind of gives me goosebumps like i love that that is so cool and so that that was the moment i remember thinking like i i'm an actor i want to be an actor and i always want to be an actor and so that is the thing if i ever get disheartened or discouraged by um any of the the tough parts of the business i think that is something i always go back to and remember that moment and how fun it can be yeah, it is. Speaking of things that are like beautiful, when you see that level of commitment, you know, when you're mm. like, oh, it's just, it's like seeing really good theater. You know? Oh yeah, really good theater always does it to you. You leave and you're so yeah. inspired. Yeah, you're you're a different person if that hit right. Yeah, that's nuts. I have not thought about that movie in a long time. Tyrese Gibson in that one. Tyrese Gibson, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. he's the bad guy. Yeah, he's the bad guy, and he mm. he was so cool. And I didn't, I don't think i had or maybe it was one day you my memory gets so jumbled with stuff uh, from (laughs) different times but like i rem i don't remember being on set with him but i remember when we were doing like uh when the film came out i went to like Mm -hmm. tiff in toronto or wherever it was and i remember hanging out with him then and i think we even like went out they they, like let me go out with them one night um and i remember he was like he just loved Twizzlers and was just giving me packs and packs. And I remember being like, man, this guy is so cool. Cause I was young at the time, but it was, sure. it was, it was such a fun experience. And that, that director, Brad was, was such a cool guy. And um, it's so cool. Cause then you end up crossing paths with people and like producers of it. And like, I ended up playing in a basketball league with Brad and the producer of that film years what? later. It's just funny how it all like comes back around. Sure. Small circles. The world's yeah, really exactly. small. And when you get it into is, certain right? industries, we all like- have six degrees of separation. That's right. From Kevin Bacon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. So I know you did that. I know shortly after that, you're in another movie that I will say still holds up uh, with a uh, thunderstruck dude. Oh. Listen, was, <laughs> is the hardest acting you've ever had to do was pretend that you weren't good at basketball in that movie. That's so funny. That <laughs> was, I think, well, to, to, to be fair, I think it was much harder for Kevin Durant to sure. pretend that he was bad at basketball. <laughs> I remember they like sitting there while we were doing a take and they were like, Kevin, 
we get that it's really hard, but can you miss? Yeah. <laughs> and he was, he would like get upset with himself. He's like, I'm actually trying to miss. And it's just like <laughs> wired in him that he's going to make every shot he takes. But sure. that was, that was such a fun experience shooting that because it was down in um, uh, Louisiana there, like being around Kevin Durant, I was a huge basketball fan and yeah, I left to, uh, I think it was my junior high school. I, uh, got a Nickelodeon show. Or I think I got it my sophomore year and I left the end of my junior year. And we'll get there. I always, <laughs> I always <laughs> talked to my dad, like, cause I, I got on the varsity team the end of my sophomore year. And then you through like the summer and then junior year, it was cool. Like going to the varsity games and being, I like, came off the bench. So like oh, I cool. wasn't our starter, but like senior year, I was going to be, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Our, the guy. So I, w- I was so, <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited. And then I left school. And so I didn't get to experience my senior year of high school, uh, playing like the packed gyms and everything. And uh, my dad, I remember him telling me he, it was so cool because he's a huge sports fan. He's the one who raised my brother and I on sports. He right flew on. out for like a week while we were shooting Thunderstruck. And he was like, I remember we were in the hotel and he was like, Hey man, this beats your senior year. Yeah. And he's like, it's all okay. And I, I always think about that because it's true. Like that, that made it all okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. It, I mean, pretty good trade. I'd say so. Pretty, oh, I mean, you know, yeah. like they have this... played with Kevin Durant's talent. I'll take, you know, it. you know, yeah. did, did you get any good tips from him? Let's say like, Hey, the ball goes in the basket, no matter yeah. where you're at on the court. Right. That's it was, it was funny. Cause we would play like one-on-one and he, I mean, it, you can't even say we played one on one because that, like, there's no competition there. But like, he he can score every time. But it would be huge if I could get a basket on him. He's just so quick and lanky and athletic, and it, it makes sense why he's like. I mean, I really Give love basketball. Man. He's the best scorer in the NBA. Like, sure, there are players that you can say are, are better players, but as far as an offensive player, he's just he's unbelievable. And it was really cool because they would stop shooting each day at around noon. I think it was like, it was either right before, right after lunch, which I've never had this on a set for. And there was an hour break that was set. It was obviously in his contract where he would practice like, and he flew out other players. So other NBA players would come and like, I would talk with him and his friends and they were like, yeah, like you're obviously not going to do drills with us, but like, if you want to stay and shoot around while we're doing it, of course. So I mean, of course I was going to take advantage of that. So (laughs) I would be in the gym while they would be running drills and I would just be shooting on other hoops or every now and then if it was like a shooting competition, I could shoot with them, but it was, it was just so cool to do it. And he was, he was so young and you forget at times, like I I was obviously very young as well, but like he was on such a huge world international scale that you forget how young the some of these professional athletes are but he sure. was like i think he was like 24 or something like that what um so really? it was just cool to hang out yeah good lord that they're they're like ant people they're made yeah. of trees like yeah exactly 24 can you imagine being like eight feet tall in high school that would be nuts i i yeah that that <laughs> blows my mind i i can't imagine being six feet three yeah, same <laughs> Same. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just hit five nine, and I was there feeling really proud of it. I'm right there with you. Yeah. We don't we don't need shorter ceilings. We're fine. <laughs> We're fine, Taylor. Yeah. No. No. We uh we live longer as well. <laughs> That's right. Take yep. that. Can't yeah. can't do that. <laughs> we. So I I'm curious because I I I don't think I've talked to anyone who's done like a basketball movie. So there's a lot of like flying dunks in that movie, right? I imagine you're yeah. wired up. There were um, there were different ways we did it. There was a mini ramp that we would go up, so that way I kind of had more freedom, where I could like oh. kind of like a half pipe, right? Okay, so it, sure. It, it kind of matched the trajectory of a jump. Like I would just jump and hit one step off of it, and it. and then I could kind of do what I needed to do in the uh, air with my body. That was cool. one. When I like jump over the car and recreate the like Blake Griffin slam dunk contest, that was on a wire cool uh, so that's like a harness and a wire and then the other one was the, oh they would this was my favorite they would lower the hoop so then <laughs> if they shot it at a certain angle i could do anything so like perfect they, like when i was doing like the alley-oops that was just a lowered hoop that they're shooting up and oh, i that's awesome i could just jump myself and catch yeah. them and do whatever so that that was probably the most fun because i had a practice doing that when i was young with my brother i remember we'd like lower the hoops to whatever eight feet 
or Love it. You know, whatever it was. And you could, you could turn into a uh, shack if you wanted. Get it. Get it. And you yeah. can walk around and be like, no wires, no wires. Exactly. Me. <laughs> exactly. It, it was so funny to do a sports film because I, I love sports so much. And in the final audition, we had to like actually play, which was oh. cool because it was like any other audition process where you, you audition, then you got a call back, went in again, then met with the director mm -hmm. and did different things. And I remember I, I had been called in to meet with the director for like the friend role oh, um, cool. that my buddy Doc ended up playing. And yeah. In the audition, like when I got the script, I remember telling my mom, and I think this is kind of who I've always been. I was like, ah, I think I, I connect more with that, the main guy. Like that's <laughs> what I want to read for. And so she was like, feeling. go for it. So I, I asked my agent, I was like, can you get the sides for it? And I'll, I'll go do what I was called in for the, mm -hmm. uh, to meet with the director for the friend, but I'm also going to memorize the Brian's lines and I'm just going to ask him. And they had told casting and casting was like, don't do it. <laughs> and so I was like, screw it. So I went in, I, I did the lines for the friend. And then I, his name, John Whitesell directed it, who's awesome, awesome guy. And I was like, hey man, so I actually really connect with Brian. Do you mind if I do that? And he was like, oh yeah, do you want to come back tomorrow and do it? I was like, actually, I, I memorized it and I can do it right now. And he was like, great. Well, why don't you like go outside, go over it and then we'll bring you in next. And so it was really cool to go do that and then end up doing basketball. Then I ended up reading for that role and we played basketball with like the final three of us or whoever it was and it was at warner brothers um on the lot where i think they said they built a, the basketball court for george clooney when he was doing batman i could oh, be mistaken but i'm sweet. i'm nearly certain that's what uh I'll, that court i'll give it to you for. yeah you had to play basketball on batman's court dude look exactly at these, look at these things we're racking up here exactly exactly <laughs> That's great, though. That's cool. You know, there, I heard a similar story with uh, William H. Macy for his role in Fargo. Same thing happened. He went in to read really? for somebody else. And then he was like, uh, so I got a take on this character if you'd let me do it. And they're like, yeah, sure. And then that's how he got that role. That is so cool. I, yeah. It's one of those things, I guess, like if you are inspired and you you feel that pinch, you have to go with it. Like, And that's yeah. part. That's what acting is, too. And, and the artistry of it is like. You have to be present to to go with. If there's an itch, you got to itch it. You know what I mean? And so I agree. that's a little bit of a different way. Obviously, it's a little more uh, premeditated. But same thing. Like if, if mm -hmm. something strikes you, you got to go with it. Yeah, it's all instincts. Like that's the point. All instincts. That's that's, yeah. that's performance. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And then you mentioned that you're on a Nickelodeon show, which yeah. one, fantastic, absolutely <laughs> great. You had the best Thanks, name man. ever, Bucket. I mean, oh, but is it the best name when when young kids are screaming it to you? Not lesson. screaming to you, but like when you're... Yeah. It depends on the tone. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> bucket. Of all things, Bucket. You, you know, my brother always said he wanted to get like a bulldog and name it Bucket. And I was like, that's, that's a funny. great name. Bro. Can you imagine if you had a dog? Yeah. In, in retrospect, <laughs> I, I love it, obviously. Yeah. Like, it's so close to my heart, but it was so funny. Like, Bucket. Bucket? <laughs> <laughs> like and it wasn't like a thing where they set up like oh his name's actually charlie but he goes by bucket it was yeah, no. just, just bucket yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean she's great just saying it is hilarious so i mean it hits the it hits yeah. the note you know but yeah i find that fascinating because it's like i mean a staple in nickelodeon right and nickelodeon shows that was on a stage is that how it was, yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was a sound stage. It was a multicam where we would do a live taping on Friday, really? every Friday night. Yeah, dude, how cool was that? That's like theater. I mean, it was amazing. Film. It was, it was exactly that. It was theater. It was like a, it was a mix between theater, a comedy show, and then like a live concert. Because oh, they yeah. would have, they have like a hype guy. Oh, cool. Gets the crowd going, and like I would say, you probably do like three, maybe four, if you're, if it's like a bigger scene takes mm -hmm. of it and so they have to keep people going while they're watching the same scene three times um Good nice point. star wars mug yeah and, yeah, thank and you, then thank you. um and then we would also like in between you're doing a comedy so you fall in love with the laugh and like yeah you 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 really start to ham it up a little bit and you realize how easily you can get a cheap laugh by doing different yeah. things <laughs> little pranks and also we we're at that age i think i was like 17 at the time so like the mm -hmm. perfect age where you just wanted to rebel a little bit and like have fun so it was just yeah. that was such a great time because everyone on the show as well was your age um sure and and like every guest star that came in was going to be around our age and mm -hmm. and it's fun to also be on nickelodeon with all the other shows that, that were happening at the time because you would 
all hang out and you would do your press together and you were it was a little bit of like a weird existence for that time on that so like it's nice to have other people are kind of doing the same thing mm -hmm. who are um just like enjoying themselves but also trying to really get good at this craft sure sure what what was like what's the rehearsal process like for something like that um so i i've described this before and so i, I can pretty concisely i have that thing. It was, <laughs> everyone's has a different schedule for uh like big bang theory any any uh multi-cam show that's on a sound stage it's going to be five days and it might be like wednesday to tuesday or tuesday to monday ours mm -hmm. happen to be monday to friday which is perfect because it means oh, boom. you kind of have your weekend and your big thing is friday night so Got we it. get the script we get the script friday night after the taping and mm -hmm. you usually wouldn't start going over to like sunday but you come in monday you do the read through the table read with okay. um so you're all up there you do the table read that morning um with the director and then all of the network and uh like writers are there and they hear it and they they then give their notes and once you're later in on the show you get to um go home sometimes like i'm sure okay. the big bang theory they didn't rehearse i bet on monday yeah. that <laughs> by the, the sixth seventh season and sure. when we first started we, we would rehearse that that day but otherwise um we would go home or like do some schooling because we were uh still in high school at the time and then sure. to, tuesday you'd come in that was a long day because you were going to rehearse all day long like first thing in the morning till through lunch till about three and then you would do a run through for the writers and then the uh -huh. writers and director would be there and then they would make notes about how to punch up jokes, what's not working. And then yeah. that night at about nine, 10, once you got home, you would get a new script for Wednesday that you'd come in with, with oh. the edits and changes. Sure. You would rehearse it again all day long. So another long day. And you would then do a run through at like 3 PM for the network. Okay. So that's like the Nickelodeon executives. And I would say there's usually like half a dozen to 10 of them. And mm -hmm. then you would get, usually not as many changes but then you would get the network notes and then thursday you would come in and thursday was usually one of the easier days because you would pre-tape meaning anything that's not going to happen in the live ah. show and it's a 30 it's a half hour show with eight minute commercials so really you're only doing 23 minutes of tv so like sure you'll maybe do two scenes or three scenes on your pre-tape day and so oh. that you have all the time in the world it's usually something that wouldn't work with the audience sure. like it'll be a gag or um like you'll do any stunts and on bucket and skinner we had a fair share of stunts so yeah we would yeah. usually do you knew thursday you were going to be falling or running into something sure and then friday was the best day because friday you wouldn't start till like noon you would come in and you would do a, a walk through so we would just walk through the scenes say there's eight scenes in the in the full episode and mm -hmm. we pre-taped three so we would walk through the five that we had to do that night oh. and then um that's just like it's almost like a sports thing like you would just kind of walk through different place you would walk through all the blocking and and everything right and then and then all your friends would come because you started later that day and Sweet. you would invite all your friends family and they'd start coming in at like four ish i remember i they'd come back to your green room and kind of hang out a little bit we i had a ping pong table in mind so like the Get cast it. would all come in we play ping pong and then they all go up into the audience the audience comes in and then it like 4 30 the cast would actually come into my dressing room and we would do a speed read where we just read oh. through all of the lines kind of like a, what you do in theater sometimes sure and then we had like a sweet little like pump up thing and then you'd go backstage and the music would come on and you'd run out and then you do your taping for like three hours like five to eight and then and then all your friends who were there we would all go out afterwards to um roscoe's chicken and waffles we had this yeah. like yeah this uh get it this tradition that we would always go to and that was fun how cool is that? Yeah. Not bad. And you did that for a while. You did a few seasons. Yeah, yeah. It was cool. We did it for a couple of years. Um, and it was it was so fun to do. And it was it was nice to like cut your teeth doing comedy and and the people who made the show were really cool because they all come from like the network comedy world and they they this was their first time doing like a show for younger people, but they all had kids, so they wanted to do it. So it's cool sure. to hear their stories and get advice from them and, and it was just so fun to to have that like live experience the way you would in theater yeah when, when you're doing the scenes on like the day of are you doing them because there's an audience i imagine is it chronologically in the story because you have pre yes on on this. those days you would and, and yeah. so, oh okay. that's actually a great question because they would so say we pre-taped the second scene of the show so sure. we would do the cold open and we we would film it whatever two three times got it moving on and then as we would go back to the dressing room to change 
for the next scene three, mm-hmm. they would show the second scene, which we pre-shot the day before oh. on the, on the screen so that the audience that was watching, cause they had mics on them. Sure. And like, say there's a joke that's their laughter. Right. And then say, right. I mean, say there's like a kiss and you, it's like, oh, or what, whatever it is, you, they get that reaction, but they also get to watch the show in chronological order so that the oh. next scene up follows. Okay. That's yeah. cool. They, yeah, really cool. Somebody figured this stuff out a long time ago. Yeah, yeah someone knew what they were doing. <laughs> that's right. There's a formula here. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty neat. <laughs> I I've always wondered because with stuff like that and shows that like run for a long time and stages and how that I did not know any of that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and yeah. They, they have it down, and it's it's also something you hear a lot of actors when they have families and they love the craft, but they just they don't really want to travel to New Zealand for three months and be away from the family, but right. they still need to like. Uh, not only make money but just continue acting and, and itching that scratching that itch sure they they'll often get on network uh shows because you can live in la you you know what your thing is like while your kids are at school you're going to work and like you have a really set um schedule which is is nice to people sure much more regimented easier to yeah you're not doing night around. shoots yeah. and <laughs> waiting like sleeping in till 4 p.m and then working till 3 a.m Sure, sure. And I know shortly after that was when Rebels happened. Not a not a bad yeah, not a bad job. Yeah, yeah. Sh- shortly after that was Rebels. Yeah, yeah. There was I don't even know the chronology of it, but that that makes complete sense. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. bad. Not no. not a bad gig, Taylor. Not a bad gig. That <laughs> that was been such a wonderful experience and I'm eternally grateful to be a part of the star wars universe and and meet the the creators that i did and work with them and the cast uh just an unbelievable experience i bet what was that audition like because it's star wars so you probably didn't know it was star wars going into it i'm sure it's so funny because i when you talk to the cast uh like any uh any of the other four or five of them they all claim to know, but I don't know if I believe all of them knew. I, I believe like Freddie and Vanessa. Maybe right. Steve, maybe they did actually. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> claims to know but me. I well, the way I got it is I had never I didn't have a voiceover agent at the time, nor had I um nor had I done it I hadn't done any voiceover, read for any voiceover, and all my sure. training was just your classic like Meisner and uh theater training. So it was all sure. live action um type of stuff. And right. My agent had sent it to me, and I remember her saying, "Like, hey, if you don't want to record this, all good. But if so, just when you record it, do it how you tape your normal auditions, because taping is a really common thing um, yep. in acting if you're out of town or not in LA. Mm-hmm. Um, put it on tape, but don't film yourself. Just like go in your closet and record it on a mic. And so I I went and recorded. It. I recorded it with someone who had like a proper booth. Nice. And I I sent it in. And didn't hear anything for weeks. And you just assume, I was like, yeah, of course. Like, I, sure. I didn't have it down. Um, because I just approached it how I would any other character. Just built out the character. And, mm-hmm. and it, I think it was only a couple pages. They didn't give too much. But they did say, like, light sword, I think they were calling it. And, like, different things that I didn't pick up on. <laughs> what was it called? It was called Wolf. So I thought it was something to do with, like, Jungle Book. Perhaps. Sure, sure. But um, I remember getting a call. I don't know if I've actually talked about this. Maybe, I'm, maybe I have, but I got a call like a month later, a month later that was like, Oh, come in. Um, they want to meet you at uh, the studio at uh, Disney, I guess at the animation studio with, uh, I think it was like five of the creators. It was Dave Filoni. Um, mm-hmm. And then a handful of other, like some casting from Disney and a couple of the producers and writers. And sure. I was like, that sounds great. And the day they set it for, I was actually filming something else that day. Oh. And it was, I was outdoor and I was, I had to do some climbing, I think it was. And I was <laughs> drenched in sweat. I had a hat on and I remember I had to get from, this is not going to uh, make sense to anyone who's not in LA, but I had to get from like Marina Del Rey all the way to Glendale, which is like a bit all the way across town and further. Right. Yeah. It's and, a four day travel. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I think I wrapped at the time. Like, I'm just going to make this up. Say, say the appointment was at four because i knew it was later in the day sure. i think i wrapped at four like i knew it was bad so i was like oh i'm, I'm never gonna make this and i i started driving because I, I knew i had this and i called my mom like 20 minutes before i got there and i started i was fine all the way there i was just listening to music and then i started to get worked up and i was like 
I don't want to do this. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm already late. I'm drenched in sweat. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I haven't gone into anything before where I did a voiceover, like in a studio, like this isn't good. Like I need to get my head straight. And she was like, just go in, like take a swing. She's like, have fun, do it. Like, and then it won't matter. Like you, you've done it plenty of times where they just say no. And I was like, sure, whatever. So I, I remember I had my hat on backwards <laughs> and I was like, whatever. And I walked in and then talking to Dave and them, I remember being like, oh, these guys are so cool. And then we, we started going through it. And I think I only did it like two times maybe with some notes or three times. And then they let me go on my way. And I remember feeling really good leaving. And then that was that. And I think within a week, I got a couple calls from my agent that they were like, hey, you know that thing you read for? I think they're, they're interested in you. They wanted to see other footage of you from other projects you've done. And uh, we'll see. And then I think I didn't find out it was Star Wars until they called me and they're like, hey, you got the offer for it and it's Star Wars. I was like, why didn't you tell me? And they're like, <laughs> and then I was thinking, I was like, it's probably good that they didn't tell me. Sure. Because then I would have really just worked myself up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. I mean, hey, if you got it, you got it. You know, yeah, you can yeah. be backwards hat, sweaty and like, I don't want to yeah, do yeah. this, but. It was really funny. And it was, you know? it was amazing. And it, it just goes, <laughs> it goes to show that thing of like, you just have to take a swing and go follow your instincts. Yeah, just do it. That's cool, though. I didn't realize that was your first, like, foray into voiceover. Do you like it? Yeah. It, it's different. It's a um, different medium. It's the same it thing, different. but different. It's cool. It's it's different. I, I still haven't – I I mean, Rebels went for a long time, and so I did a lot of that. But I yeah. think I've only done, like, one other voiceover character, um, mm. which was an episode of a show called She-Ra, which I oh, did sweet. with – just just a one off thing you know what I mean? sure but the i i remember talking to steve and vanessa who have like a resume as long Legends. as uh yeah. yeah like steve is in the guinness book of world records for it so yeah is he yeah yeah oh yeah there you go i mean yeah i mean they, come on. like he's <laughs> done everything like you could sit there and for a half hour he could continue to do different characters he's played yeah. and you, your jaw is just like he's not he's floor. not human him and D. Yeah. Bradley Baker, they're made of something and, else. And D. Yeah. Made of something. I completely <laughs> yeah. agree. And so I remember telling them, I was like, it's amazing that you, like when you're acting and especially with what you study, there's, you take a whole year on just body sure. and, and how to move your body and, and emotions and nuance. And then for screen, there's, there's the subtlety in performance. And then you have all that in voiceover as well, but it all has to come through your voice. You can't rely on yeah. expression or a movement or um, blocking. It's all channeling that through your voice. And so what it, what I found so amazing is I've done voice classes, not for voiceover, but for training your voice for theater and for different characters and working mm -hmm. from your diaphragm. And what Rebels did was it was the greatest lesson ever in really using your voice in addition to complement everything else you're bringing as an actor sure and it, it was just so cool to do and and everyone who was a part of it was so amazing and the the other actors that came in even for guest stars were just unbelievable it's star wars so you get the cream of the crop and everyone at lucasfilm sure. having worked at a couple other like studios where there's a lot of executives always moving around the, the guys at Lucasfilm, the, the guys and girls, I just mm -hmm. say guys inclusively, um, sure. are unbelievable in that they're so calm in knowing, they're confident knowing we know what we're doing. We're yeah. not worried. And if you need more takes, take more takes. If you want to talk about this scene before we do it for an hour, we're going to talk about it. Like they were oh, so cool. great about holding the creative process above everything else. And there was something sure. beautiful about that that allowed us to do the best work possible. Sure. H having come off of something like, you know, Bucket and Skinner's Epic Adventures, which is theater, to voiceover, was there a learning curve to kind of get into the swing of this is voiceover now to try and condense it through your voice? There, yeah, I had to get used to that. And also, uh, like everyone remem remembers this from the first uh, recording session. It was, it was actually my first recording session of ever doing it. Our first thing was the first time I had ever done anything. So oh, we went in and I remember I had really, like I had it off book. Whereas in voice, oh. I, <laughs> I was just like, I need to be ready. Cause who knows what's going to happen. And the way I would do anything is like, if I'm talking with certain characters, especially if it becomes an intimate moment, I would turn and speak to them. And I would turn and speak to them in, in a voice. Ah. Group, they have all of them next to each other. So I would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then I remember we did the first take and it was exciting because we knew it was this new Star Wars show. There was, there was a lot behind it. We had Dave there directing us and it was the first take we had done. And it was like, great. They were like, he was conducting. He was like, that's amazing. And then he was like, one note. And everyone obviously was like <laughs> yeah. clenching their jaw, like, please don't be me. And of course it was me. And they're yeah. like, Taylor, awesome stuff, but we couldn't hear you clearly. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just look ahead? Of you. <laughs> and I was like, oh no. And so that was something too to get used to where the scenes where it was like, say it was just Sabine. So T and I talking to each other or like Freddie and I talking to each other. I would usually turn my mic stand so that they would be just beyond my mic. So I could then ah. look to them and then I would turn it back. And then in the big ones where we had the uh, entire ensemble, you then just got used to like, you could take a cue off someone and really take in what they're saying to you. And then you would take it in and then channel it through the mic. But it was, it was really cool to pick up. And then by the end of the first season, you, you had it down and you knew sure. what was going on. And then you just, you fell into the character. Like, yeah. He would walk in and there was such a cool thing too that would happen with Dave and that every now and then he would just we would get certain things and he's like all right what's your instinct like go with your instinct here you know this character inside now and, and it's true like you would as soon as you would walk into the studio each day like it, it's almost like you would shed the skin of whatever's going on that day and yeah. then your armor would be put on and you knew what was going on and Ezra is just one I think of any character I played the one that I just can tap into the quickest and I I you empathize with and like you feel this this ownership over when like you hear someone like talk bad about a, a character choice like you understand yeah. <laughs> it but you, you rationalize it because that's what sure. we did like you created such a big backstory all of us did for our characters that while what everyone was watching in rebels i would say is just the tip of the iceberg there's so much more you know what i mean 99 yeah. percent of it exists in like what he thinks of his parents uh how he dealt with that his relationships with each character from hondo to um kanan to sabine you know what i mean to thrawn yeah. there's a really specific thing with each character and you 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 just become it and you embody it and it is such an amazing experience yeah yeah i love that do you have a favorite yeah. episode yeah uh i have a, i have a couple Okay, I'll I give three. you a couple. I, I, I can get down to three. The <laughs> okay. first one is mainly out of just uh, like paying respect to the show, and it would be the first episode. Like just fair. because it was, you know I mean, like sure, it Great was episode. it was the first time because you really established. I remember with Steve, which that was so cool. Like we all were doing our first lines, and we all went we all went with our instinct of it. But Steve, being Steve, he was like, "Wait, which one did you want?" and I was like, what do you mean? Did you not just audition with one character? He had auditioned with like 10 things and they were like, was it this one or this one? He was going through it and I was like, oh my God, he's picking the Zeb voice right now. You know what I mean? What? And it was so yeah. amazing to see, but they were all in the same vein and Dave knew, he was like, it was this one that you did. And then immediately he clicked in and then you're like, that's going to be Zeb for five years. Who knew? You know what I mean? But yeah. like, that was the case that was so interesting where it's like seeing that coming on the first episode was so cool. And it, yeah. I think that first episode really embodies who Ezra is, which is the thing I connect so much with him in that like cavalier attitude, the, the, the kid who, who doesn't necessarily know what he's capable, but is like happy and eager to go after things. And it feels this calling to do good, but doesn't know what that exactly means. Yeah. So I love that. But then as far as like episodes later into it, I would say the end of season two, when it's the, I think it's like a two parter when you see it with a uh, mall. Oh, yeah. When Maul is like calling him his apprentice and they're going through that. And then yeah. uh, Vader, I loved all that. And it was the first where we got to see Ezra have some, some, he always had some flaws and that was the beauty in him. He was this flawed sort of protagonist, but you saw he was like entertaining possibly. Well, what does this power mean when, right. I, when I tap into this emotion and the dark side? And th there's something really cool about that, um, yeah. which, I, which I enjoyed. And then my, I think my favorite episode, if, if I had to pick one would be um, world between worlds as a fan. Ooh. I just thought it was, how can you not what it did for like in the star Wars world, it, it hadn't been done yet where they like manipulated time. Yeah. Obviously the whole story with Ahsoka and you see how big of a character Ahsoka is and yeah. that he saved her a lot. Like what that meant. I remember we treated it with such delicacy yet. We just like went for it and it was, it was such a cool episode. And then, that's the one interesting thing that you don't that you don't see with 
animation is like we have no clue what it's going to look like like it has oh, a little okay. description and dave's telling us but at the end of the day it's going to change a bit and so sure that was one of the episodes disney was so cool and lucasfilm about bringing us into their studio their uh yeah yeah sorry theater mm -hmm. and we would watch the episode like i'd say we probably saw like 10 percent of the episodes like the finales the um premieres of each uh uh season and then like usually the like big episodes in between if it was like sure. something that was going to look amazing and that was one that they let us come in and we did like three in a row and that was one of them and i remember Ooh. it was it, you, it's hard when you're watching something you're, you're in less yep. so with rebels but like to dissociate and you're like saying oh could i have done this or could i have done that Absolutely. or like okay the, you know what i mean and mm -hmm. that was one of the first times with the show i was i remember getting goosebumps and i was like this just looks so cool. like yeah. as a fan i'm all about this like it, it was just so same. cool same and it's one of those like when he pulled ahsoka out it's just the <gasps> what what uh, what what we can do yeah. that <laughs> yeah exa exactly exactly <laughs> That's pretty cool. What was there any episode thinking back that was like challenging for like you as a performer? Because it's it's a heavy, it's a great role that has so many layers to it that built over time. Like, is there one that you yeah. think back on like, oh, this one, this one I had to like, I had to flex a little bit. It's true because because if you th and and that's why I think I say I I connect most with Ezra and I I can tap into better than anything because of the development like shows get canceled all the time rarely do you get to do a hundred episodes of a show right true and a, t a movie as deep as you go with it it's only an hour and a half and yep. unless you're the lead like i've been in films where like i'm on screen for 20 minutes you know what I mean so sure. with with rebels that's i mean i don't even know what it would it's like 40 some hours or something it's right? a lot like it's it's so much you're developing a character through everything you see every side of this character where he's strong where he's vulnerable where he's weak the the humor the the resolve the growth you know what i mean and sure. that was a big thing of was us talking about like how much is he maturing through each thing yeah and so i i did find it interesting but it, i just grew with ezra so much that there were things i remember telling dave i was like you've written the show so well and in all of the existentialist leanings that star wars has and that i did my degree in philosophy so i always am awesome. so drawn to those aspects yeah. i was like it's so amazing that some of the scripts you'll send me before i come in they mirrored where i was in life things that i was questioning myself you know what yeah. i mean yeah there's something so beautiful about that and and maybe again serendipitous that it lined up so well but the the maturing of ezra along the way was such an interesting thing to see like how does that change his philosophy on certain things um I was really excited for the payoff when it was a really sad moment. And it, those days when you act it are, are just, it's not that they're not fun, but you know what they mean. But mm -hmm. the culmination of the storyline with his parents, because yeah, at the end of the day, while there was only a couple episodes where that emotion came out to that extent, you know what I mean, obviously sure. with Kane, like the one where Kanan dies, it's not the one where he dies, but then the next the couple after. episodes where you see the ripple, like yeah. we were all bawling every session, like I everyone bet. was. And it was, that was something that you felt in a different way. But when the, the storyline with Ezra's parents came to a head, it felt like a bit of a relief too, because while it might not have been felt that was going into every episode, right. what he was carrying, like, where, sure. are, what is the deal? Do, did they not want me? What, you know what I mean? And it's this abandonment, yeah. it's all these things. And so getting, to release all of that was really nice yeah um but then but then it just meant like going forward with this new truth of knowing what yeah. it was you know what i mean but yeah i, I mean it, it was just so fun all around i bet what a gift what a gift oh, yeah. as, as an actor to play a role like that that's so just layered and yeah with the parents like you have that you're carrying that weight and then you get that closure and then the growth from afterwards like man not bad yeah. Taylor. not bad and then you see and then you see at the end which is so amazing with um his the temptation of his parents in yeah. the oh, remember yeah with like, palpatine it just, yeah with palpatine like yeah. it just shows the growth and also the the discernment and and who ezra has become and the, the strength he has to really um work against that it, it's just 
such an amazing character. And I, I love, I mean, I love Ezra. Yeah. I mean, rightfully so. I, so I have a question that I don't know if you'll be able to answer, but because you played Ezra, I kind of have to ask, did mm. anyone explain why his lightsaber changed color to you? Cause I've been wondering this for a long time. That's and, so funny. I know? think I made a joke to Dave. I was like, did the lightsaber change colors? Cause they need to sell more. Like, you know what I mean? Like they, they're, <laughs> sure. there's new cause Lucasfilm was always cool about, or Disney, I don't know who it was would send like lightsabers any like the figures and everything. So I had a bunch of the blue lightsabers and then it changed. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't know either why exactly. And I still, to this day, I don't know yeah. <laughs> why, why exactly it changed, but that okay. first saber okay. he had is pretty amazing. And that I, I don't think, think so. we've had a blaster saber before. No, I don't think so. It was really cool. But I remember yeah. when that happened, I was like, wait, hold on. What? And nobody's yeah. talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Did did you have to do anything differently playing Ezra for like Rebels versus like when you did it for Disney Infinity? Because it's a video game versus a show. Is there any change for um, the medium there? That was actually really weird. That was, if I'm being honest, my, you, you I wouldn't talk bad about something, but like sure. my least favorite that we did of it. And only mm -hmm. because it wasn't the normal it, it wasn't like Ezra through the world of star Wars as much as it was like you had oh, copy that was like, it was right. like th three hours straight or, or maybe five hours straight. I remember it being really long and mm -hmm. you, you weren't reacting off something. It wasn't like, it was kind of like taking Ezra out of his world and then just going like, Hey, you're going to do a commercial sort of thing. You know what I mean? Got it. Okay. And so you're, you're like, you do the different things all the way down sure. and it's like, say run say oh i won or say i lost or say right like, three times in a row and then you just get three variations and then move to the next one and and it was so fun to be able to do obviously if the sure. characters in a video game that's so cool yeah you know i mean pretty neat but get a cool uh, figure. like it, it was di it was different yeah sure it's a lot of just like efforts and like yeah little lines here exactly, as opposed was, to exactly. Like... i think an hour of it was just efforts of like I now bet. you're in a in a racer now you fell now you did this and <laughs> I remember when they sent it to me, they sent me the game and that was a weird experience because yeah. I was, just, I had moved houses and I was like, um, by myself one night. I remember like it was after dinner and I had like a glass of wine, I think. And I like, I was like, Oh, I'll pop this in. You know what I mean? And it, I had had it for a couple of years even, I think. And I, sure. I just hadn't done it for, and I put it down and I started playing and like to hear your voice. And then like, yeah. <laughs> you manipulating it was like, I was like, should I not be playing with him? But I guess it's <laughs> like a much lesser version of anyone, like any professional athlete playing like 2K or something. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Imagine if like you're Kevin Durant playing Kevin yeah. Durant. <laughs> exactly. Like, that's my face. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take every shot with myself. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I know from experience, they will always go in. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's funny. I know you did that. I know from there, the gag wars that you guys did was fantastic, super oh, super. Thanks, seems super fun and so you know, fun. Yeah, Steve again doing his thing. I mean, come on, doing his thing. What yeah. is what is what is that guy? Yeah. <laughs> but also, I actually bought, have read, and enjoyed uh, "Sold in the Name of Sex." So have you really? I have, dude. No joke. Boom. Oh, that is so awesome. Got man. it Thank handy. You so much. That, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, really, really cool. That's how I uh, blackmailed your publicist. I was like, "Hey, listen, <laughs> how do we awesome. make this happen?" <laughs> that's awesome. That's not true, but yeah, no. <laughs> so you wrote a play. Like, how did where did this come from? I wrote a play. I writing is something I love so much, and something I'm constantly doing and working out. And cool. I I mean, I've I've read a lot of script. I mean, you I mean I, I acting from about. 12 13 you were getting sent scripts for different things and i would always read them because it was like it was amazing yeah. to read some of these films and then see them years later and these massive films you're like oh wow i didn't think it was going to be that good or other ones you're like yeah. <laughs> oh wow i was picturing this but they went a different way you know I mean? and it, there's something so beautiful about it and at a certain point you read some scripts where you're like oh i think they should do this i think they should do that and you you learn story structure and everything and yeah. it was something i studied as well in university while doing philosophy it was also creative writing and then cool. screenwriting and I, I loved it so much and my buddy spencer and i uh shout out spencer daniels who is in thunderstruck he is like the antagonist oh really that's oh yeah. that's funny get and it we 
we've been close, close friends. Uh, we were even roommates in LA for a while. Um, oh, cool. And we wrote that, unfortunately, but fortunately for him, he was doing a film, um, a big action film in Korea at the time when um, a a theater company in the UK in Edinburgh during the Fringe was like, oh, we'd love to, we submitted to a couple of them and we did it really late. So we were worried that no one was going to take it. But this sure. company was like, we would love to, and we have one space um, e uh, each night and we would love to have you, we would produce it for you and put it on. No and way. so we were able to put it on for a month in Edinburgh, uh, Dude. which was so fun and so cool. Cause wow. um, I was able to direct it, which didn't, it wasn't too much directing but it was really cool i got to fly out another one of my friends um and the actress we had in it uh because it's just a it's a two-hander with a, a comedic relief um mm -hmm. it was just so fun because um we did this what how many three three years ago maybe four yeah like three years ago um 2017 like afterwards you would go and like have like different gins and whiskeys and, and it was just yeah. like so amazing and i can't wait to do something like that again because that's one of those things where you're just filling up your cup and you're purely yeah. doing it for creative purpose and like maybe one of the most fulfilled like we got some cool reviews that people had written that you're just like that's it you know what i mean like that being yeah. able to talk with people after the show was one of the cool things because it was something like you're expressing certain philosophies as well and you know what i mean in totally. your script and so it was really cool um to do something like that and also to memorize that was also an undertaking because I, I was shooting a film in New York up until the, like I flew straight out to, I, I wrapped in New York. The next day I flew to LA. I went to Bonnaroo Music Festival with my little brother because we Sweet. had tickets forever. And yeah. then hung over, I flew straight out to the UK. And I think we had like a couple days of rehearsal and went into it. And really? opening night, it was the thing that you, you have nightmares about. I forgot a line oh no <laughs> and, and i'm staring at the actress and she can tell like we were like 20 pages in and it was flying going so well and then i just didn't respond i remember thinking i was like that's a good line i wonder what they would say and i'm like <laughs> what you know what i mean and it sure just it was just such a such a weird experience but something that i feel like you just have to go through um yeah and then every other night was great and so much fun that's so cool you played luke yeah, I played Luke. Dude. Luke Rotondo. And it's based yeah. off of a guy, um, a bartender. I lived in New York for a year with Spencer. Um, we just went for a year. It was during Rebels, actually. And I, oh, I was sweet. actually flying back and forth from New York to L.A. for a little bit. And then I started recording in New York um, for a really? couple of the sessions, which was really cool because um, James Earl Jones was recording out in New York. So that no was deal. cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I was like, might have heard. I would come to New York sooner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was it was cool because. It was based off of like different, it, it's not a true story, but like sure. we picked off of stories from this bartender and his name was uh, Jacob Rotundo. Oh, we, perfect. We, yeah, it, it was just so <laughs> just much fun. Him. That's yeah. so cool. What a, what a rewarding thing to one, to write a play is freaking cool, but then to see it and to be a part yeah. of bringing it to life. What a cool thing to be a part of. So but, cool and so fun. It's something I hope to do more of. Yeah. How, how long yeah. did it take you guys to write it? Um, I would guess that we probably, cause, I mean, artists, actors, if we weren't working on something, we, we were living together. So we like get up, have breakfast and then write all the way through to lunch. Get and it. then we would walk somewhere, have lunch, and then we would edit um, in the afternoon and then in the next morning, start again. I, I think we probably got the first draft down in about a month, but that's working like every day non sure. and then through rewrites. I would say it was probably like a two, three month process and then getting wow. it to friends, getting notes. Uh, sure. doing a read through and whatnot sure was there yeah. had you written a play before this i had not written a play but we we had written a handful of scripts and i had different scripts i'd written um i'd done like some classes where you would write uh scenes but never oh, yeah, yeah. a whole um like two act sort of thing right on was it were there any hurdles that you weren't expecting having written like a play because you got to deal with the physical limitations of a stage and a set and things like that yeah, we were really inspired by it because in it, there's a drawing that like I yep. just done on a piece of paper that we put in into back. it. And we took that from uh, Woody Allen in one of his, he didn't write too many plays, but he has one where he just took some sketches of like, he was trying oh. to draw it out as he was writing it. And then he put it in. We were like, that's so cool. So we did the same. And we were like, the set is super simple. And then 
when we put it on, the way we had it done was the stage was basically split in two the way the acts are split in two. Oh, cool. And we wanted the two characters to kind of switch places where he really wants to be with her. She wants nothing to do with him. And then them fully switch where yeah. she ends up like, I'm invested in this. He's like, well, no, I just wanted the experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's that sort of cross where he starts on one side of the stage, ends up on the other. She starts here, ends up in the other. But we oh, would cool. like, I, I lit one side where it was the restaurant and the table. And then at uh, the intermission, as we would change, the bed would be pulled forward and then that would be lit up and the, uh, it would go dark on that side. So you, you kind of moved with the uh, chronology of the play left to right. Oh, that's cool. Did you have to like figure that out? Like did, when you're like, oh, that's how it works? Or you're like, oh, wait, yeah, Well, the, 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 the theater, it was the Harry Younger Hall in Edinburgh was really cool. They had a team of... Um, of lighting and props oh, and cool. whatnot and they helped with um i told them what the vision was for and they really helped to make it happen and execute it and then um and and it, it was just so cool to do and we haven't thought about it in a long time but a friend had read it and recently hit me up about it and said hey would you like to put that on at a black box in la during the um pandemic obviously safely and you wouldn't need many people because there's only three people in it. like everyone get tested and you do it and then you just stream it so it it sounds like a fun thing to do it would just be <laughs> relearning all of it again and going into it but it was it was really fun right on what a cool thing to do so as, as yeah. someone who's done like i mean you've done theater you've done on camera you've done voiceover you've written directed and performed plays like do you have any advice for like up and coming actors who are looking to kind of do the things you're doing um i i i go to the thing of like don't take no as an answer yeah. like cause, it's important cause people are co constantly gonna say no or they're gonna mm -hmm. have and it's not that you don't um just put on blinders you know what i mean and and sure. run forward but like you take every piece of advice humbly and and creatively and you move forward with it but also like you really just trust your engine and a unique idea only comes out if you keep trusting your thing and you follow through otherwise you know what i mean and so mm -hmm. there's something important about um just persevering and being patient because certain things like it, it's you always love to hear these and they go around the internet all the time but like queen's gambit um yeah you've been seeing the thing where it was like it had been told they had been told no for like 25 years Heath ledger came on to direct it and then yeah um sadly i mean that's one of my favorites he he passed and then mm -hmm. they were like it's not gonna happen so many studios shot it down they're like chess is interesting and then it's the most viewed show of like the last x amount of years and has like chess sales yeah 107 <laughs> percent yeah i mean chess books it's it's yeah. amazing and it is such a unique idea that we haven't seen before that like i don't think there's ever really a chess film where they don't base it off bobby fisher or someone who's real like to just yeah. make up this world it's amazing. And that's just a cool, very unique story. And it's something that wouldn't happen if, if they hadn't followed that idea all the way through. And so I, I just love the idea of like trust the, trusting in yourself and following your passions. Yeah. Don't let no stop you. It's like, don't continue. let no stop you. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, dude, we've yeah, been man. talking for over an hour already. Look at that. Yeah. So cool. It. Dude, this yeah. was so fun. Man, I had a, I had a great time you. chatting with you. Thank you so much. It's so great to chat with you. It's so cool that you have uh, read Soul in the Name of Sex. That's awesome. And, and thank you, you know. for a great interview, man. I, I hope uh, everything else that is put out and that we see is is cool and that you keep enjoying it. Yeah, of course, of course. Now, before I let you go, I got to ask, uh, where can people find you online to reiterate my sentiments that you're fantastic? Oh, thanks, man. They are... Uh, Oh God. My, my Instagram is Taylor gray three. Perfect. And then my Twitter is I, I am Taylor gray. At that I is, am Taylor gray. That's a true statement. That's a good, that that's is a good true. It, it wasn't that, which is funny. You know what it was? Is, Not Taylor that's gray? why I always get confused. It was something when I was on the Nickelodeon show, cause that was when we had, we were talking about it most and when I was using it most, mm -hmm. uh, Cause that it was right at like, that was the height of Twitter. Really. When we were sure. on the going, there wasn't even Instagram, which is so funny. Yeah, <laughs> it was, but it wasn't, it wasn't what it was. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, it, my thing was like underscore Taylor underscore gray. Uh, like there's so many underscores <laughs> and that's such a long thing to say. And you would be doing these, like they would have like press days on set where you would do like 10 interviews back, back. And they, sure. like, uh, they would always end it like, and what's your Twitter? And it, I, 
I remember thinking like, all I'm saying is underscore. Like that, I just, kept, <laughs> and I was like, I need to change it. And so I remember, I think it was like maybe the uh, PR person at Nickelodeon was like, well, here we can do this. And I'm Taylor Gray was so much easier to say, but then I heard it and I was like, it is odd, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's just been that. And I, I haven't changed it since, but it is uh yeah, it's a funny, funny one. I love it. I love it. Yeah. This was great, dude. Thanks so much. And... Thank you, man. <laughs> Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. I've also got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Bernice, Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well. <laughs>